Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. I am excited to introduce today Don Wendorf. He is the author of Caregiver Carols, and I'm going to let him finish the title of that book because it just slipped my mind like normal. But thanks for joining me, Don. (laughs) A musical, what is it? A musical emotional memoir, and you can order your own copy that doesn't have the sticky notes. I like mine with the sticky, but you can get them with or without. I like the color of your sticky notes. They're pink. (laughs) Yes. Thanks for joining me. And so tell me about your caregiver journey and how that led you to the book. And then we'll talk about the book a little bit. Okay. Um, I was sort of care arranger and part-time caregiver for my father who had Parkinson's and some dementia with that and my mother who had Alzheimer's, um, they ended up both in, in, you know, a care facility. Uh, And then for many, many, many years, seems like many, many, many years for my late wife, Susan, who originally was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, you know, after the million dollar workup kind of stuff. And it, it made sense. I mean, she had all the stuff. It's, I was, we were pretty convinced that that's what it was later turned out that hers was vascular and she had had all sorts of little mini and maxi strokes and continued having strokes. And eventually I even uh, retired to become full-time caregiver. At first we got by with uh, actually uh, people from church helped her out at no charge to us. We saintly ladies. Uh, And then I had some hired help for a good while and, but it it just became too much. And so eventually I retired because, um, I was a psychologist and marriage and family therapist. So, you know, I was dealing with emotional difficulties and problems and issues and stuff all day long and then coming home and dealing with that all evening long. And I was pretty tired. So that makes sense. And I always talk to people about putting together their care team. And that's one recommendation is, you know, you don't always have to hire people, especially in the earlier years of the disease. You can, you know, find neighbors, friends, family, people in church. There's and a lot did. of things people can That's do right. to help. Yeah, that. we did all the above. Uh, at first, I actually sort of took care of her by phone, but you know, eventually got to where somebody needed to really be there. And so, um, yeah, we had a number of friends, our kids. You know, we had grown kids at that point, so they helped out some. Um, but yeah, there's more help available. I mean. I finally got to a point where I, I really was needing some pretty serious help. And I went to the pastor of the church and I just said, Steve, you know, I'm drowning over here, man. I, you know, I need some help. He said, okay. And he called a, uh, a little team of ladies together. They said, okay. And they wrote out a schedule and they alternated and they came all day long while I was at work one at a time. And, and they did that for a couple of years. That's amazing. And I just had to ask. I just said, I, I need help. There That's the were. hardest thing is asking. Yeah, because I started off like everybody else, thinking, you know, I can do all this. I can, I can handle this. You know, I can juggle eighteen balls, no sweat. You know, uh, yeah, like most people, and I'll do a super job at it too, by the way, and be perfect. Yes, exactly. We always overestimate our ability, and with this disease, it's easy because in the beginning, it's not that challenging. Exactly. You know, maybe. Exactly. Maybe you have to learn a lot more patience. Right. And, you know, but then all of a sudden you realize you're drowning and maybe you haven't put a care team together and you are blessed. You, you, your church family helped you out and, you know, it, that was great. But it I was, always, it was wonderful. Yeah. Cause you're, you're right. At first it, you know, it seems kind of, I mean, we're used to having new issues or new things we've got to deal with. That's part of life for everybody anyway, or our kids reach a new developmental stage or whatever. And you know, there are more issues to deal with. Um, so at first, yeah. Uh, but the, the stress and the effects of the stress, I think are cumulative. Um, you know, as a psychologist, I, I mean, I had families that I was dealing with that had where dementia was an, an issue. And, and I saw people get burned out. Uh, so I knew very much about burned out. I could give you a three hour lecture about burnout. Uh, I knew what it was. I, I knew what I should try and do to avoid it. I looked for it. I sucked. I got feedback from other people. How do you think I'm doing? You think I'm all right? You think I'm burned out? I did all the right kind of stuff and wow, I still got it. 
Yep. It sneaks up on you. That's what's really interesting. And, you know, we all, if you get that late night call or that emergency phone call, your mom needs help or dad needs help, or, you know, you, you notice that your spouse is struggling and all of a sudden you realize something is seriously wrong here. And all of a sudden your life is turned upside down and we all, you know, I don't, I, well, I guess for obvious reasons, I've never talked to somebody that just said, I'm out. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> Forget it. I'm out. So we all step up. And then the next thing you know, you know, you've, did you have to retire early or was it about the time you originally planned? I hadn't, no, I hadn't planned it originally, but I reached 65. I, you know, I was eligible for Medicare. I could get, you know, more retirement kind of stuff. So it became more feasible to do that. And instead of paying people to do that and me burning out more, I just said, Hey, you know, I've done my thing. Let me, I'm going to retire. Is what happens with a lot of spouses, spousal caregivers is they, end up retiring early, which then of course affects their retirement benefits. And yes, it's just, Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a problem. Well, and for so many people, maybe men more than women traditionally, but more so everybody, uh, so much of who you are and your social life and your identity and all that kind of stuff is tied up in your work. And so there's for many people, just a major adjustment and maybe a lot of loss things that you've got to grieve relationships you know, the, the thing, the good things about, I mean, work is work, but there were some good things about work and I liked what I did. I believed in what I did. Um, so, you know, there was the adjustment of all that, you know, at the same time. So you said that they thought it was Alzheimer's. It turned out to be vascular dementia. I'm assuming you've heard that they're very close to the blood test that will determine if somebody has got Alzheimer's. Right. Right. Does that excite you or do you think that's a scary thought? Would you take the test if you were? You know, that's an interesting thing. And I've, I've done the 23 and me uh, genetic kind of stuff. It, it's, it's interesting. The stuff that I'm at the higher risk for isn't in my family at all. <laughs> you know, I'm not at a higher risk for Alzheimer's. I don't have the APOE4 gene, certainly not two copies of it. I, people are real different on all that. Um, I, I would be okay with having that test myself and knowing. I, I would want to know. Linda, my, my wife now, would, uh, would not. And we have a very dear friend who lives in San Diego, uh, Jamie Tyrone, who just wrote a book about the traumatic experience she had with learning her genetic status, which is she has two copies of the APOE4 gene, which means her risk of developing Alzheimer's at some point in her life is like 90%. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, it threw her into a major tailspin, and and it's it's like it's like people talk about when they've had cancer. Uh, you know, every little thing you get you get a little funny feeling here or a little funny mark here, and instead of saying, "Oh, well, that's just because I'm older than dirt," oh, it is dirt. <laughs> um, you know, it, you say it, this is it. It's the big C. It's got me. Uh, well, okay, you do this. for some people. I mean, they don't want to know. I think I would I would want to know. I'm not exactly sure why, because I wouldn't change anything about what I'm doing. I'm already doing, have been doing, all the things that are recommended and now showing up in the research as being useful for lowering your risk of every kind of dementia, not just Alzheimer's, but every kind of dementia, partly because it lowers your risk for Every major disease. I mean, the stuff that you're supposed to do. Who'd have thought that healthy living was give, was good for you? It was healthy, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm doing all those things. And in, in fact, Linda and I, uh, well, we did before the virus. Uh, we went around to local congregations here with a dementia-friendly Alabama uh, grant to talk to faith communities to get them educated. I mean, we could say, hey, we, we want to give your congregation a talk about Alzheimer's. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah okay. Don't call us. We'll call you. <laughs> you know, nobody wants to hear a talk about Alzheimer's. We, we'll talk about brain health and about healthy living. And, and it's the same things that you do for lowering your risk for every major disease it's the things you ought to be doing for the person that you're taking care of with dementia because it can give them a better quality of life. You know, it's, it's not a, uh, an absolute guarantee or anything, but you know, so if I knew what the future would be, it probably wouldn't change 
what I would do. I'd probably buy more banjos. <laughs> probably would. I would take it because I would like to be able to plan ahead. We've had yeah. conversations, my husband and I, he knows how I feel. Um, I'm kind of all for being able to go to a lawyer, go to a psychologist and a doctor that basically says, I'm in my right mind. And if I should get Alzheimer's, if I get to the point where I cannot participate in my own daily care, it's time, it's time for the permanent sleep, which I know yeah. is not legal, but at this point I'm 53. So I'm thinking, you know, my grandmother's 102. I got, I got a few years to go, I think. Wow. 102. Yeah. Nobody in my family has lived that long. Well, neither of my parents got to 80, so you never know. Mm. It's, mm. I, I ride, I ride bikes. So I, 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 you never know. So my father wanted to make it to 90. That would have broken the family record for men. And he died the month before he was 90. <sighs> we, no, 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 that's all right. We gave him in utero credit. Ah, that worked. Well, a month shy is mm. a month shy. Come on. Yeah, that's pretty dang close. I mean, I was a month premature. So where do we start counting? That's true. They, <laughs> they tried to tell me my daughter was a month early, but she was six pounds, full head of hair, long fingernails. I don't think she was a month early. It doesn't sound like it, does it? <laughs> no, they just, I think it was just their way of saying, oh, we calculated wrong. I mean, they yeah. first, at, at most, she was two weeks early because then they, you know, they give you a due date and then they're like, oh, no, wait. And then they push it out another couple of weeks and babies come when babies come. Well, I was a twin. I was an identical twin. So that, oh, that, that helps why your guys and, are an wrong. undiagnosed identical oh. twin. They're about to roll mom out of the delivery room. I don't remember this exactly, but they were about to roll her out of the delivery room and the nurse said, well, hey, whoa, no, no, she's not through yet. That's there crazy. Was, there I was wanted more. to plan ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, cribs are big enough for two little babies for a while. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so tell me how you came to write Caregiver Carol's you have to keep telling uh, Yeah, a musical emotional memoir. You think I could remember that today? I've, I've done too much already today. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had already written, before we really got into the whole thing about dementia, I had already written a self-help book, um, sort of a self-help marriage manual. Okay. My specialty was marriage and family therapy. So, you know, over, over the years, from my clients and mostly from making mistakes in my own marriage, I learned a lot about how you can do a good, healthy marriage. So I had written a book um, and I don't basically like self-help books. I mean, I hate to tell you this, but I don't. Um, I can't get past about page 25 in, in any of them. They, they just seem to be repetitive. It's like, yeah, okay, yeah, right. Yeah, sure, I should do that. Yeah, I've, I've got 80 hours in every day. I can do that. Um, so I wrote it. Um, being a musician, I, I wrote it in song lyric form, which is basically sort of rhyming verse. I put some of them actually to tunes and, you know, wrote out chords and stuff and recorded a couple of them, but mostly it, it, it was that format. So, okay, I started kind of writing down thoughts and stuff as my caregiving got going, particularly with Susan, not so much with my folks, but particularly with Susan. And I started noticing all the different things that I was going through, the emotions I was having, the reactions I was having, the behavior that was resulting from all of that. And, and I started writing all this down. And I went back to that um, song lyric rhyming verse format. So it was a very creative kind of enterprise in addition. But I, the idea of the book was to help other caregivers with the emotional kind of aspects of their caregiving. There's all sorts of stress. I also had a lot of physical stress because Susan, uh, with all of her strokes, got to where she couldn't do anything with her hands. She could only walk with my muscling her. Um, she was almost blind. So, you know, there were a lot of other, there were physical stresses too. It was pretty hard on the back. Um, but this was more in terms of the emotional stresses. But what I found too is um, as I was writing them, and I would share a lot of them with her, Whoops, my earbud fell out. Don't you hate it when your earbud fell, falls out? Um, it was a catharsis kind of thing for me. It was enjoyable for her. It was something we could sort of share. Some of them she didn't like. We can talk about that if you want. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, 
but it was very, it became a very nurturing thing for my own emotions just to kind of get them out, but also to put them out there outside of me where I could look at them and I could say, Oh, and I could show them to other people and they would say, Oh, well, you know why you did that? And here's why dude, you know? Um, and, but, and it was a creative thing. So people, you know, an artistic sort of thing. I'm not the greatest poet, I'm certainly not the greatest songwriter in the world. The tough uh, subject. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do about that. I guess I just wait. It looks like a phone call is coming in. Okay, are we getting uh, back? Yeah, I can hear it ringing, but it wasn't interrupting us, so that's okay. Oh, okay, okay. Because uh, I lost you in the, uh. in the process. I have me. Well, then it's okay. I can look at me. Um, but I don't have you. What, do, that's does, yeah. Hmm. You know anything I can do to get you back? Let's see. Not really. Hey, I'm going to pause this for a second. I sure wish I could figure out how to. <laughs> so we're having a little technical issue on Don's end. He can't see our my video anymore, but I can see him. So we're going to keep m motoring through here. Stop video, mute my audio, hide self view. No, I don't want any of those. Stop video, mute my audio now. Yeah, don't mute the audio. <laughs> no, that won't work. Um, <laughs> okay, technical issues solved. You got to click the right buttons, right? So exactly. we were discussing how you wrote the book. You were writing it because it was cathartic, creative outlet, and it right. put emotions in a visible space. And other, you could look at them and go, "Oh, okay." And then other people would look at them and say, "Aha, you do blah blah blah." I think that's where we were when your phone rang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds right. Um, and so it, uh, I, I actually got a lot of insight. It was almost like going to therapy, you know, sort of with myself. Once I would put them out there and have to think about it, you know, how, what am I going to rhyme with this kind of thing? Uh, I, I, I could reflect about myself and, and see some things that I hadn't seen. And then when I actually started turning it more into a book, I showed it to a, a number of my colleagues and other people and got feedback. And they would say, Man, this this is what's going on with that, you know. Yes, you're you're getting angry so much. Well, that's because you're so stressed, you're so anxious, you're so you know whatever whatever it was. Um, uh, anger is a, a wonderful emotion for covering up all kinds of stuff. Men are great at it. Women aren't bad at it, but I mean, guys, we've worked it to a, a fine art. Uh, you know, I it, really through writing the book is where I learned that a lot of my anger, and I was going through a lot, I was getting angry a lot and, and acting real nasty and real mean and real ugly. You know, it was, it really was bad. Um, I saw it was grief. Yeah. Anticipatory grief is rough. Some of it anticipatory, some of it for what was already going on, what I was losing in terms of as she lost abilities, um, I lost the relationship as it was. You know, we still had an ongoing relationship, and she was able always to, to right until the very end, to, to be able to converse and to know who I was, and so I didn't have that aspect of, of it. But, yeah, there was just so much I was losing in my life because of what was going on on with all that. Uh, and I learned that really from writing the book, but it also gave me a little something that I had with me all the time that was a little safe place, a little refuge that I could just escape into. Um, and so in the middle of some kind of drudgery, you know, when I'm giving her a bath or cleaning her up or toileting stuff or, you know, whatever it is, I could kind of go into that little spot and it, it kind of became a self active thing. Um, as I would be driving or, uh, I kept my running up. I've always been a runner. I kept my running up and I would have little things just pop into my head. And, you know, there are many times that I ran four or five miles and couldn't tell you anything about where I ran or anything at all. But I, at the end of it, when I got in the car, I wrote down two, verses and a chorus. So it was a neat little safe place to go to. And, th and that was kind of neat. I've, I've found I get a lot of creative ideas when I'm riding my bike. Yeah. Which is a little more dangerous because you got to pay attention to where you're going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm, I, and I don't do the running anymore. Uh, mostly it's hiking now, uh, but it's the same kind of thing. It's one of those deals where some places you have to be very careful and you, 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 know, you can fall and it's dangerous, uh, but other times you can kind of let your mind go and, and get into a meditative, mindful kind of state, which is a very helpful thing for managing stress. But I think creating is also, and you don't have to be good. I mean, <laughs> I am not the world's greatest musician. Well, Willie Nelson is the world's greatest musician, <laughs> <laughs> according to Susan. Okay. I find it's interesting because I've always been a creative person. And one of the ways that I've been handling this pandemic, of which we lost my mom at the very beginning. We haven't been able to do a celebration of life. And there are right. days when I feel guilty because it's like, well, you know, life, you know, you died, life moved on, blah, blah, blah. It just seems very flippant and like whatever, but that's not really how I feel. And right. so I'm actually creating uh, greeting cards and thank you notes and stuff by hand. And I like hand paint them. And yes. I don't really know if they're great, but it. I was looking for a creative outlet that allowed me not to clutter up my house because you know you can only have right. some quilts or blankets or paintings or I'm a photographer and there's only so many walls to hang things on. And I didn't know that. You mean there's a limit? <laughs> what? That's good. I learned I something. I never thought about hanging them on the ceiling. Maybe that's what. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's like I I need a creative outlet, but I don't want to clutter up the house. And so the greeting cards, it's like basically you're using up a lot of the supplies so i never thought of it as a well it is a stress relief for me but i never thought of it as a stress relief for the general population like i can't imagine my husband doing it because he's not a creative person but maybe i'll have to see hey, maybe that. yeah he might have to find his own way about that um because like i say it, it doesn't have to be great i mean i've been playing music and performing for since i was in in high school um, and I'm a pretty decent performer. I'm not a fantastic musician, but you know, what is the purpose of the thing in the first place? What do you, what are you trying to do? You know, am I trying to compete with Louis Armstrong? <laughs> That's going to happen. No. Yeah. Probably, probably not a good idea to, yeah. I mean, it's to share, it's, it's to share feelings. It's to share fun. It's to share pleasure, um, to, you know, it, it's a connecting kind of a thing. It's a, a shared performance art kind of deal. So it doesn't have to be great. And and it's funny, you talked about uh, making your own little hand uh, done cards because w w one of the, the things, one of the uh, pieces that I wrote, and in fact, it's one of the few s actual songs I've ever written and recorded. And I recorded it just for Susan was about w one of the things that um, I, really caught me when I first met her in college, she would paint just little cute little things, little sayings or a little flower or a rainbow, you know, some kind of cute little thing on a rock that she mm -hmm. would find or a piece of bark that she would find. Or one of her favorite media uh, was uh, rusted tin can lids. Hmm. <laughs> and, and she would, you know, send them to people if they live far away or she would leave them around where somebody would see them and it was a surprise. And that really characterized something. It became a metaphor for me about her, about who she was as a person. It was like the, the uh, Shaker hymn title, Simple Gifts. She gave little simple gifts. She was not ever going to replace Van Gogh or Monet, you know, but she was very artistic uh, and very creative in, in her own sort of way and did fabric arts and stuff like that. But that was part of, it was one of the hardest things for her about um, getting dementia was losing the ability to give to people in the ways that she always had. Of course, we all knew that the way she always gave to people was by being a very caring and supportive and empathetic and compassionate and, you know, giving kind of person. It, 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 she didn't have to paint anything to do that. Uh, she continued until her, I mean, when she was in the hospital dying, uh, she was asking the nurses if they were tired and if they had had a long shift and was she being too much trouble. And, you know, she was taking care of people while she was dying. 
Okay. So that creative thing, though, that was where I started on of this ramble, um, led to a song called Painted Bits of Bark and Stone and Tin. So you want to play that one for us? I, I can play that one for you. Um, I haven't done it in a while or practiced it in a while, so it may be kind of rough. But it's interesting. You, you know, I was telling you the other day how um, I met my present wife, Linda, Linda Everman, who is a big uh, Alzheimer's advocate. I mean, she's a fanatic. She took care of, of her father who had Alzheimer's and her mother had vascular and, and her uh, late, uh, or her, I get it mixed up. Her father had vascular. Her late husband, Richard, she took care of for like 15 years or something with, with Alzheimer's. Um, at any rate, she, the way we met was that she was co-editing a book with a, a number of other people, a book of meditations and prayers and reflections and a multi-faith kind of a thing for uh, uh, caregivers. Uh, Seasons of Caring is the name of that. And uh, I was the last contributor to that book. And that's how we met because she was assigned to edit uh, my uh, submission. And my submission was that poem, Painted Bits of Bark and Stone and Tin. And I, I make a big point of it because I think one of the things that's very important in the middle of the caregiving, when things are so stressful, at least for, in my experience, you know, I was perceiving Susan as being oppositional or resistant <laughs> or, you know, giving me a hard time about everything. And I was getting very angry. You know, I'd say, okay, we're going to stand up. And she would say, now? No, three weeks from now, I'm just giving you notice. You know, okay, put, put your feet down on the floor right there in front of you. Uh, on the floor? No, put them on the ceiling. I don't care where you put them. Put them someplace and let's stand up. You know, I was perceiving her as oppositional and, give, and, and this kind of stuff. Um, and it was helpful then to be able to step back and reflect and say, wait a second, who are we talking about? Is that who she is? Yeah, that no. is a good point. That's, that's not who she is. You know, yeah, I mean, it's harder for her to be her and to do the things that she wants to do now because there's so much other stuff she's got to deal with. I mean, she's blind. She can't walk. She can't feed herself. She can't, on and on and on. She can't do all this stuff. So it's very hard. And, and she probably had some depression and, and plus the effects of the disease itself. But she still was herself. There still was that person. And th this is the whole idea of person-centered care that we now talk about so much is, who is that person? And how can you still connect with that person? How can that person connect? And, and the idea today is that even with somebody who is essentially mute, um, uh, who can't really have a conversation, maybe doesn't even really know who you are, that person is still in there. The soul is in there somehow or other. You got to find some way of making some connection. It ain't going to be the connection you had before. And that's the toughest part. That's the toughest part. It's not going to be the connection you had before, but it's amazing what can happen. I see it so often through music. It's why I'm such a nut about the expressive arts. I mean, I, I play for a lot of respite care programs and adult daycare programs and stuff like that, trying to do sing-alongs and stuff. And I've had people participate actively in sing-alongs, singing and dancing and doing the lyrics and, you know, all the little hand movements that may go with the song or something, who are mute, who haven't spoken to anybody in months. And yeah, they say music really touches way deep down. And I've yeah. seen, I'm sure you've seen the Alive Inside. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah are... Get a box of Kleenex and watch that if you haven't. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah, I love Dan Cohen's program. Yeah, I talked to, uh, I'm not going to be able to remember his name, but a guy that was, he was active in working in that program. He was also a musician, and he knew some pretty, probably B-level musicians here in the Northern California area. It was, it was interesting. I might well, there's a movement, you know, that really came out of California. It's spreading now all across the country um, where they get together old musicians uh, who have dementia, they may not be able to have a real great conversation with you, but you put that horn in their hands and you get some people, you may have to have somebody to turn the music pages or things like that. But there are people who are, who maintain some of that ability 
forever, basically. And it's not just mes muscle memory. Um, I've looked into some of the research on all of this kind of stuff, but music in particular, it's true for the other expressive arts also, but music in particular taps so big an area, so widespread an area in your brain. It's a very complex system with connections all over the place. Um, and, but I think that the same kind of thing happens with dance or, or drama or art, uh, visual art. And, and people will start saying things or maybe bringing out some memories and stuff. Now, it's not going to last forever. You know, but in the moment that they're, they're involved with it, you have some connection. And uh, like I, I played uh, over in Tuscaloosa with, for an adult daycare center uh, that, uh, called the Bringing Art to Life program. Uh, Dr. Danny Potts, who's a neurologist in Tuscaloosa, has that program where he pairs University of Alabama students who are taking his dementia course with people who are in this adult daycare center, all of whom have dementia. Um, but you, know, you get that pairing kind of going and it, you create relationships, you create wonderful feelings in the moment and everybody leaves feeling happy and great. And I asked Danny one time, how long does that last? You know, does that last for a couple hours or two? He says it'll last a week. Wow. With some people. A week is a long time. Yeah. Or days, you know, that they're, they're, they're just more there. They're just more with you. That's really interesting. I mean, this whole thing in dementia is kind of weird anyway. Linda had the experience that both, see if I got this right, both her father and her late husband, Richard, who hadn't been able to talk to her for months and months, on their deathbed said, I love you. Oh, wow. Now, yeah. my mom walked and talked up until the end, other than she fell and broke her leg on March 8th and passed away on March 31st. I think the, the broken leg, yeah. was the last straw, you know, yeah, we hear yeah. how people break a hip, you know, healthy people break a hip, elderly, healthy people break a hip, and then pff, they're gone in two weeks. Exactly. I had noticed in like February that we were sitting outside. It was a sunny day. The sun was really warm. There was a kind of a cold breeze, so it kind of kept it pretty mild. I mean, not probably in North Carolina or you're in Alabama. Yeah, Alabama. Um, you could probably sit outside in February also, but we were sitting outside. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was, I could sit outside in shorts in February. <laughs> well, some people can wear shorts. and you know, I, I'm a multi-generational Californian, so, you know, I don't like it less than 75 or 80 is my – I like it oh. in the 80s with the nice degrees, uh. but that's me. But we were sitting there, and she – I realized that – she was probably hallucinating because she was talking about some lady and she was pointing at a tree that was probably maybe about a hundred feet away. And it, what I found very interesting is my husband who hadn't seen my mom for weeks, he kept saying, I don't think mom's going to last as long as you thought. I mean, her mom passed away with vascular dementia at 91. Now mm. my mom had early onset Alzheimer's. All right. And so she was, she started on that journey much younger than my grandmother did. And she wasn't diagnosed until 2011 and through talking to caregivers and researchers and everything that I've done over the last two and a half years, you know, people are like, it's usually two to 10 years from diagnosis. And I'm like, okay, well, she was diagnosed in 2011. So I figured she had two to three years left. Well, then she, <laughs> typical mom. <laughs> oh, like, oh, rats, it's happening again. I'm getting a phone call. I don't know how to stop. So typical mom, she, you know, I figured she had two to three years and she, she was like, nope, I, yeah, I want to do things my own way. And so, you know, that's been the beginning of my year that 2020 has just been not, I, I saw a shirt that I really should buy, but it's not really my style. It says 2020 and then underneath it has the stars and it's only one star is filled in and it says, do not recommend. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I could feel that one, but I'm not. Well, gonna you're, that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's awful new for you. You're really still almost probably in, in shock. You got a whole lot of grieving left to do. And of course, any of us who've really lost anybody that we love know that grieving is never over. I mean, it changes, it evolves over the years, but in some ways, 
it, it, you're never totally finished with it. And it's not only grieving, it's also rebuilding because when somebody that you have a close relationship with dies, part of you dies. Part of you is relationships. You don't carry all of yourself around inside your epidermis. Some of that is the, the relationships that you're in. So there's a lot of rethinking and rebooting and retooling and, and recreating of, of yourself too. So, yeah. Well, and all that's a big challenge when, yeah. you know, the care home that she was in was really great. She came out of the hospital March 12th. I saw her the 12th, the 14th, the 16th. And on the 17th, they said, oh, my God, this virus. No more visitors. They just locked everybody out. Right. And I did not see her for two weeks. But the uh. two days before she died, they called and said, she's not doing very well. We think she'd do well if she had a visit from you. And I've said this multiple times. I said, thank God, because I said, I have sheltered in place. I have stayed home and I was about ready to storm the gates because yeah. I was, I was really concerned. She thought I was her best friend and I was concerned that she would forget that relationship. And then she would not trust me. And she was being very yes. combative as yeah. it was. Yeah. And yeah. I pictured it being really terrible. So I saw the caregivers, the, you know, the, the ones that worked there. The day before she died, the day she died, because we did, they did call us, and <laughs> I don't mention the name of the place yet because ten of us ended up outside her room the day she died, and the poor executive director was like trying really hard to get rid of us, but not, but in a really super polite and positive. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I don't think he expected all ten of us to like all end up there at the same time. We didn't either. So they well, were you know, you, you, what you're talking about uh, brings up some, the whole thing with COVID and all that it brings up some really huge issues, particularly for people with dementia or people in care facilities, because one of the biggest health risks that most people don't even recognize as a health risk for every major disease, particularly with dementia and for worsening your situation is loneliness. Mm -hmm isolation and loneliness it's epidemic in our society and people people are not even really aware of that so what do you do about people we, we know a number of people who are in care facilities and you know we're relating to them long distance by phone uh, but loneliness is a horrible horrible problem and and you can die from, from loneliness. Um, before I forget about it, you, you were talking about hallucinations a minute ago, and I wanted to say something for caregivers that they may not be aware of. Uh, you can have hallucinations with some kinds of dementia. There are dozens of different kinds of dementia, okay? And they're all different, and everybody's individual dementia is a little bit different too. But you can have hallucinations, but you can also get what's called delirium. Mm-hmm. From a urinary tract infection or from the pneumonia, you know, I used to be able to tell when my father had a urinary tract infection because from one day to the next, I mean, he's just crazy as a Betsy bug. <laughs> that, that, I'm sorry, that, I don't, that's a technical term that we learned in graduate school. He was <laughs> disoriented and confused and, you know, obviously not thinking clearly at all. And you get him on an antibiotic and in three days, he's back to being pop. It, it's funny because ma, my mom would have issues and the care staff would be like, Oh, I think mom might have a UTI. And the first two or three times I'd rush her over to the doctor and she was at this stage where the first time I, they're like, well, do you think you could get a urine sample from her? And I was like, are you kidding? <laughs> I'm like, okay, you know, I'm an adult. I can, <laughs> I can try. I don't want I might to. get a bloody nose. Or a <laughs> well, I'm just thinking, yeah, like you, like anybody wants somebody else that close to their genitalia. It's just like, it's just right. not how we are raised in our society to just be all that anything hanging out. And that didn't, and then they said, well, you know, she needs to pee a little bit and then you want to catch the midstream. And I'm like, dude, I can't hardly do that. And there's nothing wrong with my brain. It's just once I start going, you know, by the way, that's one of the, one of the things that I wrote about in, in the book was the whole business of dealing with somebody else's bladder issues and poop issues and snot issues and bloody nose issues and all that kind of stuff. And I, I, I put as much humor in all of these things as I possibly could because a little, you know, a spoonful of 
sugary humor makes the medicine go down better. Okay. So, and, and humor automatically gives a person perspective. That's true. You know, humor is being able to sort of step outside or above something and look down and say, whoo, that's weird. So I put a lot of humor in it. That was one of the pieces that Susan didn't like <laughs> very uh, much. That's interesting. Well, because it was so personal. It was about her poop and her pee and her, you know, it was about her kind of stuff. But I learned to deal with all of that. The worst part of dealing with all of that is just the idea of dealing with all of that. But, you know, it's not a whole lot different. Once you get into doing it, you just do it. It's just something else you got to do. Uh, it's not that different from having infants. True. You know? A little less cooperative, but. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I think my mom knew that that stage was coming. She was having trouble eating. I wasn't aware until the very end that the caregivers had been feeding her frequently, oh. which I have mixed feelings about. And I, I have somebody I need to talk to about. Her husband had cancer and Alzheimer's. And in his board and care home, she told them not to feed him. Well, I'm, I'm like, he didn't starve to death. I know that much. So I got I to gotta find out how... You know, did he just do finger food or did they give him stuff to drink? I need to, I need that answer because I had planned on talking to her about my mom, but like I said, mom had her own plans. Yeah. But like I said, you know, mom, I think my mom was like, oh yeah, we're not going there. I'm out. <laughs> Which thankfully, because she really, really hated being helped. And I kept trying to find ways of helping without it looking like help. Right. Right. And she would just, I'll never forget the day we came back. I always took her out to the park or wherever to watch kids. I always joked that we were the creepy old ladies watching kids. And we came back and she needed to use the restroom and she was wearing the Depends. And like I said, she was completely mobile and she sat down, she did everything she needed to do. And as we all have occasionally, as she's trying to pull the Depends up, the toe gets stuck in the hole. Now we've all had this issue. Stupid yes, toe. been there. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's a regular problem for all of us. And I knew if I said anything, she'd get angry. So I waited and I said, well, let me know if you need any help because I'm always here to help if you want it. And then I just kind of visually disappeared from her line of sight. I could see her, but she couldn't really see me. And she's struggling and muttering and blah, 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 blah. she's just and I thought this is gonna get really bad. So I, I finally went over, I'm like, I, I, I'm gonna bend over in front of her and I'm I'm afraid I'm gonna get whacked or something. And I'm like, oh, dang it, your toe is stuck. That happens to me all the time. And I quickly fixed it so her toe was not <laughs> I think you scared the dog. <laughs> the, the the ring chime just uh ding My phone must not be on mute. Uh. Anyway, so I, I went over and I bent over and I, I said, oh, your, your silly toe is stuck. That happens to me all the time. And I, I basically unhooked her toe and like backed up like I knew I was going to get smacked and I didn't. And then I just, I walked out of her room. I let her finish everything. And she comes in her room. She goes, I hate it when people have, rah, rah, rah. she was really angry. And I was, we had just come back from my house. I was exchanging her warmer weather clothes for the cooler weather clothes. And I'm just hanging them up and I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. And she stops out of her room. And about like five minutes later, she comes back. She goes, oh, hi. And I'm like, hi. Hi. <laughs> she didn't smack me, but I knew there were just times I was like, you try to help her and you try to do it in a very, oh, no big deal kind of no manner. Big deal. Yeah. Well, I'm you like, just touched on a whole, a whole lot of stuff because I mean, what I heard from what you were just talking about there is some people, it's very hard. People who have been very giving people sometimes don't know very much how to receive help. And everybody's real different about that. Um, I figured that my father, who had been an army colonel, and then he was a full law professor. Wow. You know, he's, you, yeah, I mean, he used to be sort of at the top of the heap. And, and he, I thought he was going to be pretty difficult. And he wasn't at all. He was very, very gracious about everything I did to help him. Very, very thankful. I mean, everything was real cool. But it also made me think about um, the ways that you, you know, that you were trying to do that to 
sort of preserve her, her sense of dignity and her sense of independence and being able to do something meaningful and, and functional and productive and, and on her own. Uh, I mean, it reminded me when uh, my friend, the neurologist I was talking about, Danny Potts, took his father to the Caring Days daycare center where he learned to do art. He'd been a caregiver. I mean, he'd been a sawmiller all his life. He'd never done anything creative or artistic in his life. He ended up being an artist. And there were people there that taught him how to do all that. But if, if he just said, Dad, we're going to take you over to this adult daycare center. Uh, it's full of nice people with dementia, nice people who will take care of you and do everything for you. I mean, it, it, yeah, imagine you saying that to your mom. Well, it'd be the same. But he said, Dad, I uh, want you to visit this place with me. And looking around when I was in there the other day, they got a bunch of stuff that needs looking into. They got a bunch of stuff that needs fixing and could be kind of tidied up and stuff. And, and would you mind taking a look at all that? But helping them find a way to have, still have a purpose and feel useful is important. Yeah. And I have an insight on your dad. You said he was a full colonel and then a law professor. Yeah. He had people that did things for him, underlings for lack of a better term. Support staff is probably a better term. <laughs> and so he was used to people doing things for him. Whereas like my mom was very independent. You know, she stayed home. She raised my sister and I, she got fed up with my dad at one point and, and went out and got a part-time job on her own. And then he threatened to retire. And she was like, Oh, you're not going to be in my house 24 seven. So they bought a one hour photo lab together. My dad had done photography on the side, mm. like my whole life. Mm -hmm. and so that ended up being a family business so she had you know her own way of doing things but she never had people that did things for her she was yeah. always in service to my dad or my sister and I or our clients or whatever you know she's right. also in a women's service organization so she was always the helper not the one getting the help so I think that's one of the reasons that some people, when you think, oh, they're not going to, ooh, this is going to be really tough, and they're easy, and then you, you know, my mom, you know, she raised kids, so she, you would have thought she would have accepted some of the help, and, you know, when my, I think when we first moved her into the memory care, I made, I talked about, you know, how nice it was to be retired, and you had people that were cooking for you, and, oh, isn't it nice you don't have to put up with dad's cooking anymore, because as her mind got bad, my dad, who was a horrible cook and a horrible <laughs> cooker, <laughs> he took over and she would, she would complain, you know, he didn't have patience. So he'd like fire up the burner to too hot. And so things would, uh, it was just bad. It was all bad. And she would complain about it. So I would, I would comment. It's, be a, it's an issue and it's a learning curve. I mean, most people who are, who are dealing with some kind of dementia, I mean, just like I've, I wasn't a caregiver before. Well, they've never had dementia before. So it's a learning curve for them too. And they're struggling and they're just trying to do the best that they can. Um, w with Susan about the whole thing of, you know, feeling like she couldn't do anything for anybody. Well, she couldn't do anything for anybody the way she always had because she couldn't paint, she couldn't see, she couldn't quilt, she couldn't, she fixed food for tons of people. Okay. She couldn't do any of those kind of things. But what she could do was give them the blessing of giving to her and taking care of her. Giving and receiving are just different parts of the same thing. And it's a blessing to give the gift of receiving well. And so I was able to remind her of her own <laughs> belief system on that, that you, you are giving something, you are blessing these people by letting people help you and take care of you. I think I wish I had known that that thought process before mom got really the last 10 months of her life were really challenging. She just kept getting more and more obstinate and combative and frustrating. <laughs> like, yeah. The last visit I had with my mom, she refused. She didn't know who I was at that point. She refused to, to have a visit. With mm -hmm. uh, That's so much of this involves training and, and, you know, with, with staff, it's like the, the having things done for you. People learn how to do things for other people in ways that help them preserve their autonomy and their dignity. You know, I've been talking with a, a friend of mine who's 91 and, and he's in a care facility. And, you know, this 23-year-old little girl comes in and he has to strip naked and she bathes him. 
Mm-hmm. Well, there are ways of giving baths to people that preserve some dignity. You can say, here, let's put this washcloth over these parts, and w- you help me, you, you wash this part, and maybe you may have to guide a hand or something, but you know, a, a lot of it is training, and a lot of it is is empathy. I mean, that's part of what I had to do with, with Susan, particularly, was to put myself in her shoes and say, what is this like whatever it was, this action or this thing we're trying to do or this incident or this emotion. What, what is that like from her point of view? I know it, something about what it's like from mine. What is it like from her point of view? Because she's responding out of her point of view. She's not responding out of my point of view. Yeah. And so, you know, and, part of these things that I remember I talked about, I saw her as resistant and oppositional and all this stuff. What finally I was able to ask her, you know, when we weren't in the middle of a battle about, walking down the hallway or something, uh, I was able to ask her. And what she said was that she's afraid all day long. She's afraid of everything she has to do. Everything causes her fear. She's either afraid that she's going to fall. She's going to hurt herself. She's going to make me fall. She's going to hurt me. She was some of that that I saw as resistance was her protecting both herself and protecting me, which if, if, I mean, that's who she was, you know, why didn't that occur to me? Well, because I was so stressed and I was burning out and, you know, uh, I needed, needed something to wake me up on all that. It's interesting because my sister had mentioned to me that my mom was always telling her, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. And I thought that was, that's interesting because she never says anything like that to me which is not entirely unusual because my sister and I are extremely opposite people. We don't see the world the same way. I'm not even sure my mother raised us the same way, if that's even (laughs) possible. I mean, you cannot get much different. And my sister always went with my niece, who is a sophomore in high school at this point, (laughs) for high school, home, (laughs) distance. Wherever that may be. Um, (laughs) And I always thought, it was interesting that my sister, you know, claimed that I'm not denying that that mom said that to her. I don't, I never, I never heard it. So I find that interesting that you finally got that out of her. And I know my mom was combative with my sister, but it's just, well, you know, it's, uh, it's different. Your relationship, I don't care how much you are alike. I, I have an identical twin and my relationship with my mother was very different from my twins relationship with our mother by the way she remembered me longer than she remembered him which is in that we're we're identical but twins can be kind of competitive to me it meant i won (laughs) (laughs) but what i had uh, a number of caregivers tell me with susan was that she could be very different with them when i wasn't around which is why it's so important, you know, not only does the caregiver need some respite from the person they're taking care of to be able to recharge their batteries and rest and get some things done and all that kind of stuff. It works the other way around too. They need a break from you. Yeah, that's and, quite true. Yeah. And, you know, we tell ourselves, yeah, but nobody else can, I know how to, exactly how to do it. Nobody else can do that. It would take me forever to train somebody how to do it. You know, I do it perfectly. They don't have to have perfect care. No. And, you know, they don't. <laughs> They'll be fine. They have to have good enough care. It's, it's kind of like you got to keep them alive, right? Yeah. And, and, it, and if you, you take care of the basic needs and stuff like that, but it doesn't have to be perfect. And, and they may benefit from the respite just as much as you do. It's part of why I, I do the respite care sing-along kind of things that I do because everybody needs a break. Yeah, that's true. And you probably benefit a lot from the performance. Yes. You're giving and, but you're also, you're giving to yourself by performing and you're giving to the people that are there, which kind of segues me into you performing the song (laughs) of tin. Painted bits of bark and stone and tin. (laughs) That's, I mean, my husband laughs. It's not quite as much because I'm mostly retired thanks to this virus from photography, but I would collect the weirdest stuff from the strangest places. <laughs> we have a, a, our outdoor table is made out of wooden bleacher seats and oh. everybody loves it. Nice. Yeah. And that sounds kind of cool. Yeah. It's really cool. Cause there's like, 
um, there's a heart carved into one of the seats that says Allie loves Keith, you know, and it's just, I see beauty in weird, twisted pieces of what most people think is garbage or junk or whatever. And I, I see the artistic potential in it. It makes him crazy. He's very glad I don't drag that crap home anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, hey, there's even a term for that. that's found art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's perfectly legit. Absolutely. I mean, that's what photographers do. You know that. You know, you see something and you see it through an artistic, creative photographer eye. And uh oh, here we go again with the stupid. Oh my goodness. This I'm going to shorten this a little bit because it's. I, I know we're way over our time anyway. Um, you're going to have to edit it. Too bad. Uh, I'm going to do the this. I'll do the song that. Uh, this was the second song I ever wrote. Uh, okay. In fact, I've only written two. So. This was uh, the one that was in the book and the one that uh, got me into the new marriage. But this is the one that, that, that was to me the metaphor of who Susan was. And it was very helpful for me always to remember this. Painted bits of bark and stone and tin. I'll leave off the instrumental uh, opening and ending and break just to get it a little faster. She won my heart in college when she lived across the street. Her roommate was a friend of mine who thought that we should meet. I liked her looks and kindness. What made our love begin was her painted bits of bark and stone and tin. I'd leave for class each morning, come back again at dark, to find she'd left a love note painted on a piece of bark. Or maybe on a shiny rock I'd spot as I walked in. Her painted bits of bark and stone and tin. She'd stop and chat on campus when I'd study neath a tree. When she'd leave, I'd open up my book again to see a sweet verse on a rusty tin can lid she'd slip within. More painted bits of bark and stone and tin. Grow old along with me, she wrote, the best is yet to be. That Browning poem she would quote proved true for her and me. Who guessed that such a little rhyme would lifetime love begin from painted bits of bark and stone and tin. We married, raised two sons, shared together thirty years. Now her health is slipping fast, the end of her life nears. So it's my turn to care for her and keep love flowing in. Bring her painted bits, bark and stone and tin. I know that I must let her go, release her from my heart. Let presents stop our past so our forever love can start. But I'd give all I treasure for that pleasure once again. Of her painted with some bark and stone and tin. I'll let our now and up far then not always to begin clutching painted bits of bark and stone and tin. Yay! <laughs> thank you, thank you. That was awesome. All caregivers should be able to have an outlet like that. Well, I think they need to look for them, yeah. I do. <laughs> I, do. Well, I really appreciate this and the song. I hope everybody enjoys the song and gets the book because it sounds like it's totally worth reading. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I hadn't read it in a while. I read it again just to see what it was like. I was surprised by how much anger I'd had. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm looking at it, you know, from a little farther away now. Well, I think a lot of us feel that anger and so it's it might be helpful to read it, somebody else's, and how you dealt with it, and maybe just it'll help us release our own. Right. And when you get into it and you start thinking about feeling guilty, try and turn that guilt into regret. That's an interesting thought. That might be a good place to leave it so people can think on that one. There you go. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.